scratching posts need to be tall. Ideally, they need to be longer than the length of your cat with its legs stretched out at the front and the back because when they stand up on their rear legs to scratch, they really like to stretch those front legs out. So the taller, the better. There's different types of scratching facilities we can provide. We can have scratching posts in cat trees, like the one behind me, where there's several platforms where also they can enjoy climbing and playing too. Uh, you can get single uh, standalone scratching posts like this tower one here with a bed on top and you can also get uh, ones like this one here which sit on the floor uh, that allow for horizontal scratching so the cat can stand on the pad and scratch that way. That's particularly good for elderly cats who don't like to, to reach up and pull down as much as younger cats do. Um, as you can see, they can be made of different types of things. This one is cardboard, while these two behind me are sisal rope. Um, each cat will have its own preference, so it's really important that you learn your cat's uh, preferences. from solitary hunters, where their prey would be small mammals such as mice and birds. Those cats would need to eat up to about 10 small mammals or birds a day to survive to meet their nutritional needs. So it's no wonder that our cats need to eat little and often. However, many of us feed in large meals two times a day, for example. So what can we do to be more cat friendly when it comes to feeding and make sure that we feed little and often without having to wait on them all round the clock? Well, the first thing we can do is we can use timed feeders. Feeders that you fill up, you set them to go off at a certain time and they open up and release a small amount of food. We can fill those in the morning, setting them to go off at different times during the day, making sure our cats get small and frequent meals. Another thing that we can do is we can use puzzle feeders, which is a fantastic way of mentally and physically stimulating our cats, making them work for the food, which is what they would do, after all, in the wild when they're hunting. Puzzle feeders come in all different shapes and sizes, and there's lots of different ones available on the market, so try some and see what works best for your cat. But you don't have to buy, we can also make them. I've got some examples in front of me that I just wanted to share with you today. Um, this one, for example, has lots of different compartments that you can place food in, wet or dry food, um, that your cat has to stick its nose or its paw in to get the food out. This one really encourages your cat to be physically active because as the ball rolls, the food that you've placed inside, this one's for dry food, falls out. And you can change the size of the holes to make it easier or more difficult, depending on your cat. These ones that look like little mice, you fill in some biscuits in here, and then you can hide them round your house. So not only is each mouse a puzzle, but the act of finding them is a puzzle as well. And this one here is filled with lots of different um, depth of tubes that your cat has to put its paw into and scoop out the biscuits. As I mentioned, you don't have to buy them if you don't want to. You can definitely make them using really simple items that you may have in your home. For example, an egg box. We can fill an egg box uh, with a few biscuits, making sure we stick within our cat's recommended daily allowance of food. And in the beginning, even that, the cat will have to work for more than it would just eating from a bowl. Or, as the cat gets better, we can start to shut the lid and the cat has to physically open the lid. Come on, Ember, do you want to come and demonstrate? You know what we're doing, don't we, darling? Let's put some in here for her. So, part of her meal today can go in there. Also, cardboard 
rubber tubes, which we so often have in our home, are really, really useful. Again, you can fill just a few in the beginning to get your cap going. Here we go. Leaving some of the biscuits out actually in the beginning so the cat learns what they have to do. And then they'll learn to put their paw in there or roll it around. You can even um, cover the ends with tissue paper to make it a bit harder. A really nice thing that you could do is stick lots of cardboard rolls together in a pyramid shape and fix that onto the floor or against the wall so the cat has to um, reach its paw in to get the food rather than rolling them around to get the food. There's so many ideas, so be creative and have fun making your cat work for its food. As a general rule, we recommend the number of litter trays to match the number of cats you have in your house, plus one. So if you've got one cat, you need two litter trays. If you've got two cats, you need three. And if you've got three cats, you need four. Cats don't always like to urinate and defecate in the same trays, so it's important that we give them lots of choice. When we're thinking about the type of tray, it really depends on our individual cat's preferences. Some prefer closed or covered litter trays, like this one here, often called a litter box which has a, a cat flap to go into that can be removed and can be left semi-open or fully closed. Others prefer an open tray, which is simply a tray with no high sides um, that they can easily step in and out of. It's really important to learn your own cat's preferences and also to recognise that actually they might prefer to urinate in one type of tray and defecate in another. The other really important thing we should think about when we're thinking about litter trays and boxes is the size. This size is appropriate for a young cat, an adolescent, juvenile, kitten, but not for a full-sized adult cat, particularly not the larger types of breeds. Really, the litter tray should be big enough for the cat to be able to step inside and comfortably be able to turn around. Generally, the bigger, the better. We also need to think about the type of litter. There are so many different types of litter on the market, it's often hard to know which to choose. As a general rule, avoid those that are perfumed. They may smell nice to us, but cats have very, very sensitive sense of smell and often find them aversive. So stick to unscented. Litter generally falls into two types, clumped and unclumped. When a cat soils in the litter, the clumped variety forms a clump, exactly as it says, and that is easy to scoop out and remove. With the non-clumping versions, it is more difficult to remove all the soiled litter and often a full change of litter is needed. Regardless of what you use, scoop, scoop, scoop. Try and keep those litter trays as clean as possible because the cats won't use them if they're dirty. Litter trays should have a full clean out every week with new litter put in and be scooped daily. The last thing to consider is to where to place your litter trays. Ideally you want them scattered throughout the household, not in a line all in one place, so that individual cats don't feel that they have to be forced together to toilet. We want to choose places that are quiet and accessible for our cats, avoiding places like next to washing machines or dishwashers or televisions or thoroughways where children and other animals will be going through. So picking nice quiet areas, but don't forget they're there. Remember, we need to scoop, scoop, scoop and keep them clean. Play for cats looks very close to the behaviours cats show when they hunt. Lots of stalking, chasing and pouncing. We therefore need to give lots of opportunity for these, making sure they direct such behaviours onto toys and not our hands and feet. Toys should always be used in play and wiggling fingers and toes is a no-no. No one wants to be ambushed by their cat. Wand toys are great at getting cats to play. 
a nice long wand with a small toy at the end made of feather or a small stuffed toy are excellent at mimicking prey. The secret to success to get your cat to play well is how you move the wand. Avoid bouncing movements, but instead use fast, straight movements, pulling the toy away from the cat to elicit a chase. Do let your cat capture the toy several times during a play session. It's no fun for them if they are never successful in the hunt. When not using the wand, keep it away out of reach from your cat. This maintains its high value so your cat is always ready to play with you and stops the cat chewing on the string and potentially ingesting parts. A bit like feeding, little and often is the best way to play. You can also leave out toys for your cat to play with by itself. Light toys that easily move such as ping pong balls and small toy mice are great. Make sure they have no removable parts your cat could swallow. Some cats really like to rake bigger toys with their back legs while lying on their side or their back. So provide larger stuffed toys or long shaped cat toys that are great for these. Rotating which toys you have available to your cat helps keep your cat's interest and you will often see renewed play when new toys come out. Like puzzle feeders, toys can be homemade Scrunched up paper makes a great ball and wand toys can be made with garden canes or sticks, string and a little stuffed finger of a glove or a baby sock, for example. The main thing is you and your cat have lots of fun playing little and often. Cats are natural climbers. They enjoy being up high. In fact, they actually feel safer when they're up high and they can survey their environment. Thus, we need to give them the opportunity to climb in our homes. Dedicated cat trees and raised beds are a great way to provide this. And you can see some examples in these pictures of a floor to ceiling cat bed, a radiator bed, that attaches to your radiators or heaters on your home, allowing the cat to get up and rest off the floor while remaining warm, which they love. And this um, scratch barrel, which is a scratching post, but has beds within it at different levels, letting the cat climb up off the floor and relax. You can also look round your home and see what shelves, furniture, um, windowsills, worktops, etc. you would be willing to clear and perhaps place a cat bed on to encourage your cat to utilize. We've got to think about our cats living alongside us and with us, rather than just creating one dedicated small space of our home for them. And here's some lovely examples. You can see in that first picture that they've kept most of the top of the bookshelf clear so that the cat can climb up and walk along it and rest on it and survey its environment from up there. In the middle picture, we see they've put a nice soft cat bed next to the windowsill so the cat can jump up and look at the outside world. And in the last picture, we see a cat surveying its environment from the top of a cupboard. They love to get up high, so clearing those spaces and having nice steps up to there where they're using shelves or other pieces of furniture is absolutely ideal. You can even encourage your cat into these raised areas in play by dragging a wand toy over the raised area to encourage your cat to get up there. Some homes even have dedicated shelving that creates raised walkways for cats, as we can see in these pictures here. resources. What do we mean by this word when we're thinking about our cats? Well it's basically all the things that our cats need, the things we need to provide for them in our homes. So toys, food, water, litter trays or litter boxes, beds, resting places, hiding places, safe places and scratching facilities. All these types of things. These resources that cats need should be distributed throughout the home 
not just all in one dedicated place. We need to let our cats utilize as much of the home environment as possible. And each type of resource and each example of each resource should be placed in its own location, separate from the other resources. Okay, so if we think about, for example, our litter trays, we may have a two cat household and three litter trays. They shouldn't be provided all in the same place in a row. We should separate them out around the home. And the litter trays should be separate from the food bowls, which should be separate from the water bowls, which should be separate from the scratching posts. So we need to be really imaginative in making sure that we utilize all the space available to our cats and get these distributed across our homes in a way that suits us and our cats. When we've got more than one cat, it's important to remember that we need to provide separate access to the resources. So for example, um, if we have a, a shelf uh, as a safe place or a, a vantage point for a cat, it's important that there's at least one way to get up and one way to get down from that shelf. So if one cat's up there, another cat doesn't block the access of the cat up there from getting back down. If we've got things such as uh, cardboard boxes that we're using as, as hiding places, cut two holes into them, an entry and an exit. Again, so no cat can get stuck in there by another cat sitting across the entrance. And by separating all those resources out and having multiple examples of them, no one cat can monopolize them. It's all about providing several choices for each of our cats. Here's a bit of a diagram to help us understand the concept of distributing resources. On the left hand side, you'll see an inappropriate setup where all the resources, in this case, we've highlighted the food, the water, the litter tray, a toy, and the scratching post are all in one dedicated room. This isn't ideal for the cat at all. If we look at the floor plan on the right hand side, we see for the cat, this is much more appropriate. We actually have multiples of resources, so two beds instead of one, two litter trays instead of one, two water stations and two feeding stations, and so on. And these are distributed across all the home, all the rooms in the house. Um, and within a room, they're, they're separated. They're all not just all sitting in one corner or against one wall. So spread out those resources as much as we can to make our homes cat friendly. For cats, it's really about quality of interaction over quantity. Of course, they love to know they're loved, but it really is on their terms. Cats prefer positive, consistent and predictable interactions with people. There are general rules to how cats prefer to be interacted, but each cat is an individual and will have its own preferences, as we can see in the picture of the cat being tickled under his arms. That's unusual, not many cats enjoy that. Most prefer gentle strokes around the cheek and under the chin. Let's learn the language of love for your cat by watching this video. Cats vary on how much they enjoy interacting with people. At the extremes, some crave human attention while others will actively avoid it. Most cats are somewhere in the middle, enjoying some form of physical interaction with their owners at least. There are some general principles to take into consideration when handling cats. Firstly, it is important to consider how cats physically interact with one another. That teaches us a lot about how cats like to be touched. Cats tend to greet one another face to face usually by briefly touching noses as they sniff one another. If the cats know each other and are friendly towards one another, they may then rub their faces against one another. In some cases, they may rub their bodies against one another and even intertwine their tails or sniff each other's rear ends. Cats that are very closely bonded may rest in close proximity to one another or even in physical contact. 
They may also groom each other, generally on and around the head. Thus, it is no surprise that cats prefer contact around the head and face as opposed to other parts of their bodies. These areas are rich in scent glands, particularly under the chin, the cheeks, the corners of the mouth and the area in front of each ear where the fur is sparse. Cats use these areas to rub against other cats, people and objects, depositing chemical messages. Before stroking a cat, it is always a good idea to offer a hand to the cat to see if it chooses to facial rub against your hand. If it does, this is often a good sign that it will be receptive to being stroked. Once you have stroked a cat, it is always a good idea to stop and observe what the cat does. If it moves towards you or rubs its head against you or just generally remains relaxed and close to you, it is a clear sign that the cat enjoyed the interaction and is likely to be happy for it to continue. However, if it moves away or does something else, the cat is clearly saying it does not want any more interaction at this time and that should be respected. Cats generally prefer stroking in two forms. Gentle, slow stroking with the hand or fingers in the direction of the fur and scratching with the fingertips. This tends to be preferred on the face, particularly under the chin and round the cheeks. But every cat is different, so it's important to learn what each individual cat likes. As well as being stroked on the head and the face, some cats enjoy being stroked down the back, onto the base of the tail and even up the tail. However, many do not enjoy this and those that do enjoy it often only do so for a short period of time. Some cats enjoy being picked up to be stroked, while others would prefer not to be. However, sometimes cats need to be picked up. For example, if being placed into a cat carrier, if not trained to enter voluntarily. To pick a cat up, it is important to greet it appropriately, so as not to startle it, to try and come down to its level as much as possible, and to gently but firmly pick it up using both hands, one supporting the rear and the other supporting and gently restraining the chest and front legs. Many cats prefer physical interactions that are little and often, as opposed to one long bout of interaction. There are always exceptions to the rule, so it is important to read the cat's body language to check it is enjoying the interaction. Signs that a cat is enjoying the interaction include pushing its body weight into the hand stroking it, slow rhythmic purring, and gently closing the eyes. Even a sociable cat can have times where it no longer wants to be stroked, either because it is simply not in the mood, has become overexcited, or has become frustrated by the handling. Typical signs to look for that are good indicators the interaction should stop include dilated pupils, rolling quickly on its back and side to side, claws being revealed, paw pushing your hand away, the cat suddenly moves quickly, scratching or attempting to scratch you, scratching the floor or furniture and skin rippling and twitching. Following these tips, should help you get the best interactions out of the cats in your lives. Cats do purr when inviting people to pet and stroke them, but it's not the only reason that they purr. Cats have lots of different types of purrs. Cats purr in positive situations. So for example, when interacting with other cats that they enjoy the company of, when they're sitting together and resting together, or when they start grooming each other, they'll often purr. Kittens will also purr to their mothers and the mothers to kittens, particularly during suckling. Cats also purr when they interact with us. And researchers have actually identified two different types of purr in those situations. The first is a non-solicitation purr, 
This is a purr that your cat does when it's enjoying your company, when it's resting, sitting on your lap or being stroked by you. That nice, slow, rhythmic purr. The solicitation purr is a purr your cat performs when it wants something from you. For example, when it wants you to feed it or let it outdoors or to give it attention. That purr has a much more high pitched component to it and often occurs a bit faster. We tend to find that purr not as nice to hear in comparison to the other one. But cats also have been reported to purr in negative situations. For example, when they've been injured or in pain or in distress. And also breeders will tell you, many queens will purr during labor. Why would they do this? Well, a number of thoughts are given to this. Some people believe that it's to help calm the cat. It's self-calming. It's trying to reduce the arousal it feels relating to the negative situation. Others have suggested it might be a cry for help, although this seems much less likely because cats having evolved from a solitary ancestor don't tend to rely on others for help. In fact, it's actually very difficult to tell if a cat's in pain because they usually mask the signs. So how good are we at identifying these different purr contexts? Let's have a go. Remember, we've got our solicitation purr, which is a purr where the cat is wanting something from us and often has that high pitched component within it. The non-solicitation purr that the cat performs when it's enjoying just resting next to us or on our lap or enjoying a stroke, that slow rhythmic purr. And the negative situation purr, the one that happens when the cat's in pain or distress. Let's listen to number one. Any ideas? Let's listen to number two now. And number three. Any ideas? Well, to help you, number three was the solicitation purr. It's probably the easiest one to identify. The ones that were a bit trickier, number one was the non-solicitation, that nice slow rhythmic purr. And number two was a negative situation, the one where the cat may have been in pain or distress. The difference between number one and number two might be quite hard to detect to the human ear if we're not used to hearing them. But number two was much quicker. The inhalation and exhalation of the purr occurred much, much faster. All cats need safe places, not just those that are timid. A safe place is somewhere that's private for the cat, that's secure, and it can often be raised off the ground. It provides the cat with a feeling of enclosure, of isolation, which is often important cats. They don't like to be in company all the time. It provides them with a sense of seclusion, control over their environment, perceived protection, and the opportunity with, to withdrawal. That's really important in our busy households. So how can we provide it? Well, it can be as simple as providing a cardboard box, or should I say several cardboard boxes. We don't need to spend lots of money and we don't need to have fancy beds, um, but of course we can if we want to. But a cardboard box is a cat's best friend. Place it on its side for easy access and a roof gives that extra feeling of security. Boxes can be really good to reduce stress in cats that are um, coming to new homes, or uh, spending time in boarding catteries or cat hotels or living in homing centers, all different types of environments, boxes can help them. You can actually get cardboard boxes that have a, a perch on the top. This helps cats cope with new environments even more because once they're uh, confident enough to stop hiding in the box, they'll come out and perch on the top. So these are really good in new environments, but every cat will love one of these. And you can make them yourself by getting a box with a lid and turning the lid upside down and securing it to the top of the box. We can also use perches and shelves to get safe places up high. In this picture, 
the bookshelves have been arranged in a step-like fashion to allow the cats to have several levels. Extra beds and blankets create additional comfort and security because cats like that feeling of feeling safe by being cosy in a bed that has um, a lip around it, if you like, so that the cat can sit within it and feel safe. Size is important if you've got more than one cat. Create safe places that are sized singly for a cat and also others that are big enough to house more than one cat. Give them the choice. So think about using that three-dimensional space for your safe places, making sure that you've got some up high and some accessible on the ground. It's also worth thinking if your cat has access to the outdoors, providing safe places in your garden. And we can do that in lots of different ways. Lots of shrubbery and bushes will help to provide that protection and cover, but you can also create purpose-made little cat houses and outdoor shelving areas as well. And of course, your own outdoor furniture will act as a nice place for some shade or to be able to get up onto a chair or table and feel that little bit more secure being off the ground. Leaving your cat carrier in the home at all times is a really good thing to do for lots of reasons. First, it gives your cat a safe place, a nice bed, somewhere warm and quiet. You can put a blanket on top of it, as is shown in this photograph, so the cat can actually perch on top of it as well as go in it. But also, it's a really good thing to do because many cats don't like going in their cat carrier because they associate it with going to the vets. But if you get your cat used to the cat carrier right from kittenhood by leaving it out in your home with treats in it, toys in it and comfy cozy bedding, your cat can start to build up positive associations with it and value it as a safe place. This means when your cat goes to the vets or another place out of the home in it, it's not as scared as it would be if it only associated it with that trip. We're actually making a portable safe place and therefore we should make the beginning of the vet trip even better. Doing this alongside making sure your veterinary clinic is cat friendly will mean trips to the vet will be so much less stressful for your cat. So leaving the cat carrier at home is a definite yes. <laughs>